of the area of discovery, and the shuttle has cleared the tower. Seven four computers now have primary control of critical vehicle function. to our talk with Mr. Maxim Yemelyanov, Minister Counselor in the Embassy of Ukraine in Germany. Our topic at today's discussion will be the possible future peace between Russia and Ukraine, idealistic or realistic. Mr. Yemelyanov will hold a 15 to 20 minute address and after you, the delegates, will have the chance to ask questions. Currently, there are many of you watching, so we expect many thoughtful questions. For some background info to the conflict before we give Mr. Yemelyanov the floor, the crisis in Ukraine began with protests in the capital city of Kiev in November 2013 against Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych's decision to reject a deal for greater economic integration with the European Union. After a violent crackdown by state security forces drew an even greater number of protesters and the conflict escalated, President Yanukovych fled the country in February 2014. In March 2014, Russian troops took control of Ukraine's Crimean region without firing a single bullet before formally annexing the peninsula after Crimeans voted to join the Russian Federation in a disputed local referendum. 
Russian President Vladimir Putin cited the need to protect the rights of Russian citizens and Russian speakers in Crimea and the eastern part of Ukraine. The crisis, the crisis heightened ethnic divisions, and two months later, pro-Russian separatists in the Donetsk and Luthansk regions of so southeastern Ukraine held a referendum to declare end independence from Ukraine. Many states, including the Ukrainian government, do not rec recognize this proclamation of independence. Violence in eastern Ukraine between Russian-backed separatist forces and the Ukrainian military has, by conservative estimates, killed more than 10,300 people and injured nearly 24,000 since April 2014. Although Moscow has denied its involvement, Ukra Ukraine and NATO have reported the buildup of Russian troops and military equipment near Donetsk and Russian cross-border shelling. In July 2014, the situation in Ukraine escalated further into an international crisis and put the United States and the European Union at odds with Russia when a Malaysian Airlines flight was shot down over Ukrainian airspace, killing all 298 passengers on board. Independent air accident investigators concluded in October 2015 that the plane had been downed by a Russian-built surface-to-air missile. In September 2016, investigators said that the missile system was provided by Russia, determining it was moved into eastern Ukraine and then back to Russian territory following the downing of the airplane. Since February 2015, France, Germany, Russia, and Ukraine have attempted to broker a cessation in violence through the Minsk Accords. The agreement includes provisions for a ceasefire, withdrawal of heavy weaponry, and full Ukrainian government control throughout the conflict zone. However, efforts to reach a diplomatic settlement and satisfactory resolution have been unsuccessful. In April 2016, NATO announced that the alliance would deploy four battalions to Eastern Europe, rotating troops through Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland to deter possible future Russian aggression elsewhere in Europe, particularly in the Baltics. These battalions were joined by two U.S. Army tank brigades deployed to Poland in September 2017 to further bolster the alliance deterrence presence. Ukraine has also been the target of a number of cyber attacks since the conflict started in 2014. In December 2015, more than 225,000 people lost power across Ukraine in an attack, and in December 2016, parts of Kiev experienced another power blackout following a similar attack. These attacks were associated with Russia. The previous US administration continued to pressure Russia over the involvement in eastern Ukraine. In January 2018, the United States imposed new sanctions on 21 individuals and nine companies linked to the conflict. In March 2018, the US State Department approved the sale of anti-tank weapons to Ukraine, the first sale of lethal weaponry since the conflict began. And in July 2018, the US Department of, Def of Defense announced an additional, additional 200 million in defensive aid to Ukraine, bringing the total amount of aid provided since 2014 to 1 billion. In October 2018, Ukraine joined the United States and seven other NATO countries in a series of large-scale air exercises in Western Ukraine. The exercises came after Russia held its annual military exercises in September 2018, the largest since the fall of the Soviet Union. Currently, the conflict is ongoing, but remains on a low simmer, with multiple ceasefires majorly keeping the peace. However, there are many reports of these ceasefires being broken on singular occasions, leading to smaller skirmishes and casualties. Mr. Yemelyanov has kindly come here today to speak to us about this conflict. Deputy Ambassador Maxim Yemelyanov has worked at the Embassy of Ukraine in Germany since 2019. He is in charge of the political, cultural, and humanitarian tracks of the diplomatic mission. Mr. Yemelyanov started his diplomatic service in 2009. In 2011 to 2015, he worked as the head of the ambassador's office at the Embassy of Ukraine in Great Britain. After his London tenure, 
He headed the office of the first deputy foreign minister of Ukraine, responsible for countering the Russian aggression as well as reforming the diplomatic service. From 2018 and until his posting to Berlin, he served as the counselor at the cabinet of the foreign minister of Ukraine, where he was responsible for the preparation of foreign ministers' visits to the EU member states. Mr. Yemelyanov graduated from the Kiev National University with a master's in international relations. In 2015, he was awarded with the Diploma for Graduates in Economics with Merit from the London School of Economics and Political Science. He is an alumnus of the George Marshall Center for Security Studies, as well as a fellow of the Asian Forum on Global Governance. Mr. Yemelyanov. Mr. Yamilanov has prepared a presentation for us. During and after the presentation, you will have the chance to ask questions via the Secretariat Forum mailbox. If you wish to pose a question to Mr. Yamilanov, send a message to the Secretariat Forum mailbox, not the Plenary Forum mailbox, using the category Forum Work slash Debate. The Secretariat will read selected questions to Mr. Yamilanov. If you are in your if you are in our live audience, please approach the microphone on the left. We ask that only three people stand in line with the microphone at a time. We ask that you keep your questions clear and concise. Please note that we will try to accommodate all questions, but we may not be able to. Mr. Yemelianov, thank you once again for doing us the honor of joining us here today. You now have the floor. Hello everyone, it's very nice to be here. It's very nice to see you all, despite this misty and gloomy weather in Berlin. And thank you very much for this introduction. I know that uh, my surname is a bit difficult to pronounce. Thank you, for the thank you for the background. And I would like to start my presentation and give you a little bit more insights where we're now what is my country facing right now? But before doing this, we have to go back with you a bit into the history and to, to try to understand what has determined the situation that we have today and our conflict with Russia. Please have a look on this map. You see in red Ukraine, which is uh, the biggest country in Europe in terms of territory. The country with population over 35 million people. Kyiv is the capital of this country. Our statehood dates back to the ancient time of Kievan Rus from the 9th until the 13th century. And apart from us, Russia and Belarus also claim to have Kievan Rus as their cultural ancestors. And if you look on the names Russia and Belarus, you will also understand that these countries derive their name from this Rus. Apart from that, during the main part of our history, the territory of Ukraine was divided between Russia, its, its different variations like Russian Empire or later Soviet Union, and the West, also in different formations starting from the Grand Duchy of Poland and Lithuania and later to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Your Ukraine was always a battlefield between rivaling countries. If you look at our location, if you look at we are actually located between two civilizations, between two political systems, between two ideologies, I mean Russia and I mean the collective West, as we sometimes call it. Ukraine was the country that suffered the most from totalitarianism and from Nazis during the 20th century, that suffered the most. And we regained our independence in 1991. This year we're celebrating the 30th anniversary since independence. And 
during these 30 years, we have lived already three revolutions within 30 years. And the main reason for these revolutions, for this mass protest, was the desire of people to live in a free, democratic, prosperous country and to have clear understanding where we're going. Are we going to, to the east or are we going to the west? And the turning point in this respect was, as Marius just mentioned, the year 2014 and the revolution of dignity. That was the mass protest that was triggered by the decision of ex-president Yanukovych not to sign the association agreement with the European Union. And here on this small uh, map, you can see that all countries that are striving to be a members of the European Union, namely Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia, all of them have now territorial disputes with Russia. So the purpose, is very, the purpose of Russian government is very clear, not to allow our integration to the, to the West. Well, this tragic event followed by the seizure of Crimea and the war in Donbass. As a result of this aggression seven years ago, we lost 7% of our territory. It's like equivalent of modern Scotland. And we lost 20% of our GDP. Because Donbass, the parts of Donbass that are just now occupied by Russia in eastern Ukraine, is famous for its industry. And it's a very heavy burden, economic burden, that we are paying. For those of you who may say that uh, this Russian aggression and seizure of Crimea 2014 was a rational move, that it was a real politic in action, so to say. For those of you who think so, I would like to remind that it was for the first time since the Second World War that borders in Europe were altered by force, that it was in a clear violation of all international commitments and all bilateral commitments that Russia gave Ukraine. And UN Charter is one is a particular example to this extent. But one more case that is worth your attention is what happened in 1914 when the so-called Budapest Memorandum was signed by the US, UK and Russia and Ukraine. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, Ukraine inherited the third largest arsenal of nuclear weapon in the world. More than other countries except Russia and the United States at that time combined. And under pressure, in 1994, we gave up this nuclear arsenal in exchange for security and economic assurances by Russia, the United States and the United Kingdom. And in after 20 years, Russia simply disregarded these assurances by annexing our territory. And why I'm stressing Budapest Memorandum? Because I think that this is a very dangerous precedent that opened actually the Pandora box. Because ask yourself a question, how can you proceed right now Iran, North Korea, or any other country in the world who would like to possess nuclear weapon or nuclear capabilities to give up it in return for vague guarantees. This was a clear breach of non-proliferation policy and it was a very dangerous precedent. There have been many experts at that time when we were con con contemplating whether we should do it or not to give up upon our nuclear weapons. And many people argued rightly that if Ukraine gave up its, uh, would, would give up its nuclear weapon, then the, the Russian aggression will be inevitable. This is exactly what happened. 
but you will be right to say that there is no subjunctive mood in, in, in history, and we have what we have. If we look today, where are we now? Where is my country? What the challenges we are facing? Today, Russia is turning Crimea, which is a very important port on the Black Sea, into a military base. And according to our information, they have already placed nuclear weapons uh, to the peninsula. And also that they are relocating constantly ethnic Russians. And at the same time, they banned the parliament of the Crimean Tatars, those indigenous people who resist occupation and who live on this territory for, for many, many centuries. The situation is in the Black Sea region is deteriorating. Russia blocked, and you can see it, you can see Black Sea and also Azov Sea, and there is a small passage, Kerch Strait, it is blocked by Russia. So basically we don't have access to our key ports. At the same time, this striped area are occupied territories in the eastern Ukraine. The war is going on, is going seven years now in a row. And, well, maybe someone say that it's not a hot phase, right? But we lose soldiers each and every day. And for us, uh, for us the life of our soldiers have value. That's why we believe that uh, the conflict is very much on. Russia is building troops right now along the border. Maybe you've, you've heard reports that uh, the possible escalation, according to our data, can occur already this winter. They are, apart from military options, they also using multiple warfare tools to achieve its goal. They are conducting so-called creeping annexation by issuing on these occupied territories hundreds of thousands of Russian passports. And then they will say that, well, probably it's time to protect uh, Russian citizens on these territories. These destructive measures are backed by very effective, I must admit, disinformation and propaganda campaigns. The one that Russia is famous for during uh, already from the Soviet times, cyber attacks that we are experiencing in Ukraine almost every day. They also are using private military units. Probably some of you have heard already about Wagner Group, the group that is operating not only in Ukraine, in Donbas, but also uh, in Mali, in Libya, in Syria, in different parts of the world. So this is a uh, hybrid warfare, as we call it. You don't need a direct military option. There are other solutions and other tools that you can uh, use to achieve your goal. In case of Ukraine, the strategic goal of Russia is very simple. To make us fail. To undermine us. And later, I will explain you why this goal is so preoccupied by Putin. Russia also weaponizes energy as a very effective tool of pressure. The Nord Stream 2 pipeline is a very good example. And especially for me as for a Ukrainian diplomat working in Berlin. This is a very uh, painful issue that uh, burdens significantly our relations with Germany. The main goal that Russia is pursuing by using energy as, as a weapon is basically to create alternative routes that will bypass Ukraine in terms of supply of gas. Maybe some of you know that Ukraine for many decades was the main and remains the main gas transit land in Europe. The purpose of Putin in this respect is very cunning, clear and simple. To deprive us from gas transit, to deprive us from the gas consumption, to blackmail, test, and increase pressure on us. No gas flowing through Ukraine means that there will be fewer incentives for our European partners, for example, to support us. And this will be another, another invitation for a new escalation wave. 
I'll give you, I want to give you some examples. Look uh, on, on the gas disputes and uh, Russia's blackmailing on Baltic states, for example, uh, a bit before, uh, a bit, uh, a long time before. Look what happened just recently in Moldova. So we have seen this, uh, we have seen this uh, uh, destructive actions and we understand right now that energy diversification is the key priority for my country. Ukraine and the Eastern Europe as a whole is now main geopolitical center, one of the main where strategic interests of big powers intersect. As I just mentioned, we allocated at the turn of two civilizations, two political systems, two different ideologies. Putin once famously told that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the biggest or the greatest geopolitical catastrophe in the 20th century. With his wide ranging destructive action in Europe, but also in Syria, in Libya, in other par uh, parts of the world, he pursues his ultimate goal to force Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, Georgia to return to his sphere of influence, like it was in the Soviet times. And we understand that we cannot change our neighbors, that we cannot escape our geography, that we are to some extent prisoners of geography. But what we can and what we want. We want to define our future by ourselves without no one dictating us what to do or what not to do. During these last seven years, Ukraine is fighting for its civilizational choice. And this choice for us is obvious. We are Europeans. We share same history, same culture, same traditions. So for us, our aspiration to become the member of the European Union and NATO are completely legitimate. History teaches us that after war comes peace. But if you ask me, I don't believe in peace with Putin's Russia. I believe that conditions are far from mature. Because of Putin's real politic, we have already lost 14,000 people and our land was grabbed and still is grabbed. He claims, Putin claims that Ukraine and Russians are one people. But big brothers don't behave like that. If they're not criminals, they do not stuck in a bag when you slipped. So my main point today for you is that only successful Ukraine, only democratic Ukraine can serve as a good example, as a beacon and as a guide for other countries in the re region, including Belarus, including Russia itself, to go the way of democratic transformations. And with Russia that respects other countries, not bullying them, with Russia that gives back what it has unlawfully seized, with the Russia that is trustworthy reliable partner. With that Russia, we may talk one day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yemelyanov, for your insightful and clear remarks on the geopolitical history of the Ukraine on, and on the unique nature of the Russo-Ukrainian conflict. Once again, Mr. Yemelyanov has kindly opened himself to questions. If you wish to pose a question from online to Mr. Yemelyanov, send, send a message to the Secretariat Forum Mailbox, not the Plenary Forum Mailbox, using the category Forum Work slash Debate. The Secretariat will read selected questions to Mr. Yemelyanov, and we ask that you keep your questions clear and concise. If you're in our online audience, please come up to the microphone. We ask that only three people stand in line at the microphone at a time. How long do you we will We will start uh, with a question from our um, present audience. Sure. How long do you see Putin remaining in power? Uh, 
but I think that it's not about Putin. I think that uh, it's more complicated. I think that it's more about Putinism because Russia is relying on its uh, military or its on its security forces, and well, Putin is bad, but uh, who knows who may come? I mean, the the conditions for a democratic Russia uh, are not established in this country, so that's why I believe Putin or someone else, but the 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 policy of Russia will remain the same. Tuvalu, do you believe Turkey will play an important role in controlling proxy militias in eastern Ukraine through dro drone sales? Well, we have a very good relations with Turkey, and uh, Turkey supports uh, Ukraine's independence and sovereignty. Uh, we have a very intense military cooperation with Turkey, and uh, it's not about Turkey supplying drones to us. Uh, it's uh, our... Uh, mutual cooperation that is important and for every country that is ready to supply a uh, weapon to Ukraine then we will only uh, welcome this uh, this move next a question from our live audience um, what measures do you believe or wish um, to be taken against um, Russia take taking territory um, wha when they are a pretty strong military threat and are difficult to go against internationally and um, in internally from the Ukraine? Uh, the biggest challenge that we have uh, to respond to Russia's, uh, to Russian aggressive actions is actually uh, the, uh, the, 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 the unity uh, of uh, West, in this case, uh, the unity of our joint efforts, uh, the international solidarity and sanctions, uh, uh, particularly effective tool. In this respect but uh, I mean this is not only about sanctions uh, it's uh, about proactive foreign policy uh, and joint efforts that uh, can quickly react on any sign of any 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 destructive action that Russia may uh, uh, project on us or on any other country in the region or in the world Um, it's from the delegate of Finland and the political committee and they ask uh, what do you think that Western forces like the EU and the USA can and should do to help solve this conflict? I believe and we believe Ukrainians that what the EU and NATO should do I mean the countries that are members of these uh, organizations they should accept Ukraine as their uh, full member of the European Union and NATO Uh, our next question will be coming from the audience again. Yeah, uh, hi, I'm Finn. Just thank you for coming again. Um, that was an interesting talk. I wanted to ask, um, because throughout your speech you made a point of Ukraine um, having democratic values, uh, wanting, holding also just these, uh, you said also European values of like democracy, that sort of thing. Um, in his introduction talk, Marius mentioned a referendum that was held in 2014 where uh, the Crimean people in a vote apparently chose to secede and join Russia. Um, if Ukraine is a democracy, like um, that means rule of the people, how does the Ukrainian government sort of respond to this? Because at least from one perspective, um, it seems as if s the cr Crimean people apparently want to join Russia. Um, so how, does how do you respond to this? Does that matter what the Crimean people think? Is, this not, is it true that they want to be part of Russia? Or how, do you, how does Ukraine, the Ukraine respond to this? Well, we respond that this referendum um, has nothing to do with democracy. It was absolutely illegitimate because Russian forces were already on the ground. Uh, and how can you hold referendum uh, on a barrel of a gun? I mean, this is impossible. I'm not commenting here uh, the wish of Crimeans, right? I mean, maybe some of them want to be part of Russia. Maybe some of them do not want. But this is not how things work. Uh, in, in our world. Uh, this is not how there is international law in place, there is international order, and you have to respect it. If uh, uh, there will be similar referendums like that in other countries uh, in the world, then there will be so many uh, separate parts. 
then you will just simply uh, got lost. This is not how it is working. For example, uh, look at the referendum in Scotland uh, uh, five or so years ago. There was legal procedure and uh, Scottish people were allowed to vote and they voted against the independence. Uh, this is how this should, should be uh, uh, organized, but not the vice versa. When you have Russian soldiers and they had and still have Russian black fleet on the Crimea and uh, well, <laughs> this was a clear sign of aggression. And if you talk about values well, during the revolution of dignity, uh, despite all skepticism right now uh, in many countries about the European Union and uh, Brexit happened just recently, but uh, Ukraine died on the center square carrying EU flags. So for us, I mean, uh, th this, is really, uh, this is really something that matters. And referendum here has nothing to do. I mean, and all this, uh, the, the, the pretext, the pretext of uh, Russians military coming to Crimea was that we have to have, uh, we have to, to have uh, protect Russian speaking people, but I'm Russian speaking. The majority of people from my, uh, from my capital, Kiev, are also Russian speaking and we don't need any protection. I mean, this is a pure propaganda thing. Okay, thank you. The next question from Poland from the Historical Security Council is, how effective was reform slash diplomacy been in managing this conflict? Is the only way to get out of this issue force? Well, I wouldn't say that uh, currently there is a clear solution in sight. As Marius just mentioned, uh, there is a Normandy format and uh, the, 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 the ground base of, of, of this conflict is Minsk agreements that uh, were signed uh, in 2014 and later the new uh, package of measures in 2015 by four countries, by Ukraine, by Russia, by uh, Germany and uh, France. And we are engaged in these negotiations in this Normandy format uh, without a particular success. Uh, and the reason for this is just uh, Russia doesn't have any interest uh, in uh, in, in solving the, the issue because, well, to have this wound open, to have an open border between the occupied territories and Russia, and uh, from, from there to bring weapons, to bring mercenaries, to bring soldiers, and to destabilize, uh, to destabilize Ukraine on a relatively low cost, well, that, that, that is the purpose they pursue. And once again, if you look on other countries that also have problems with Russia, like Georgia, Moldova, uh, it's, I mean, the pattern is, 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 is very clear. The next question will be coming from our live audience. Uh, please uh, say your name and your role in our conference. Um, I'm Olian and I'm Israel and the Disarmament Committee. And I wanted to ask you how likely do you think uh, it is that the Ukraine joins the EU and the NATO? And if it's likely when? Well, <laughs> unfortunately, it's not, uh, it's not up to us to decide. I mean, but uh, we, we hope that, we believe that, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, we feel ourselves uh, as, as a European country, we are located uh, in Europe. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's very worth mentioning that those countries uh, who strive to become members of the European Union Georgia particularly and, and Ukraine, they all uh, had conflicts with, with Russia. Georgia war in 2008 and then Ukraine 2014. It's a difficult question because uh, uh, there is skepsis even here in Germany uh, about our uh, NATO perspective uh, and also about our European aspirations. But I believe that we deserve it I believe that if we allowed to enter the European Union and NATO, then this will be uh, an additional advantage to Europe as a whole and to the North Atlantic community. Uh, because n right now we are in, in the limbo to some extent. We, we are regarded as a buffer zone. We don't want to be this buffer zone. We want to be with a community of values that we share 
And for us, this obvious, uh, this, this choice is obvious. In our history, you know, in, during these 30 years, we have been always uh, thinking whether we should go east or whether we should go west. But what actually Putin did in 2014, despite the aggression, he did a favor for Ukraine because he united Ukrainians. And for the first time in our history, the majority of people during the presidential elections in 2014 voted more than 50 percent for pro-Western candidate. And this trend repeated five years later in 2019. So what I mean by this is that the country is united and the strategic course is clear. And we hope that one day our partners from, from, from the US, from, from, from Germany and other countries of the EU and NATO will support us. What we're, what we're working on right now is simply two things. European perspective for Ukraine, which means that uh, it doesn't have any uh, practical implications. Just tell us that one day we can become a member of the European Union. Just give us, give us this uh, incentive because we are fighting the war. Show that our ambitious matter. We are fighting the war, but simultaneously we are embarking on, on, on very problematic reforms in my, in my countries that are very painful. Yes, we have problems. Yes, we have corruption. Yes, there are domestic problems. But one should think, uh, one should see it in a broader picture. How Europe will be strengthened if Ukraine uh, are in, or Georgia, or Moldova. Okay. Thank you. Our next question comes again from our online audience from the delegate of Italy and the SPC uh, who asks, what solution do you suggest to make Ukraine less economically and agriculturally dependent or less economically dependent on the gas sector, especially considering the construction of North, Stre North Stream 2? Yeah, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Russia is uh, weaponizing energy and we see it very clearly. And Nord, Nord Stream 2 is a very particular example. But by the way, South Stream uh, that going through Turkey is also uh, not something that uh, we very much admire. So the, the key priority for us is energy diversification. One particular example is that uh, since 2014, we are not buying, we've been for many years almost 100% dependent on Russian gas. But from 2014, we we haven't we haven't bought a single uh, cubic meter of gas from Russia, so we are buying Russian gas, but from from other countries, which means that this crisis also creates opportunities for us that we have, but th that we shouldn't miss them in these opportunities. And uh, energy renewables, Ukraine is the big country where you can have. Uh, you can uh, produce hydrogen. I mean, and we are working with Germany on this. Uh, we have projects that we can uh, uh, that we can uh, uh, put in life uh, on, in in renewable energy. But at the same time, what we're stressing in the case of Nord Stream Two is that if Ukraine uh, loses this gas transit status, and now we are the the major transit land of gas then there will be no incentive from from our partners to protect ukraine because now they depend on us and moreover we will lose a very important leverage in our negotiations with russia because right now there is interdependency if there is no gas flowing through ukraine then we are in a jeopardy and this is a very dangerous development for us because, as I, as, as I mentioned, look what is going on right now in Belarus on, on the Belarus uh, po po Poland uh, border uh, with, with this migrant crisis. So for us, I mean, the, the goal is, is very clear to divert attention from what can potentially happen this winter in Ukraine. Our next question will again be coming from our live audience. Okay. My name is Jonas Nam from the Youth Assembly. My question is also uh, directed uh, towards the energy uh, sector. Should the completion of the North Stream 2 uh, gas pipeline be stopped from Germany, especially confronting uh, with the gas crisis yes. in Europe? Yes, absolutely. Okay. But it's okay. difficult. Uh, I mean, r r realistically, uh, 
uh, seeing this development. I mean, Nord Stream 2 will probably uh, uh, become operational very soon. Uh, and uh, as I, as I told you, we don't like it, and I think that uh, we and we 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 say it openly to our German counterparts. We believe that uh, Germany uh, is al always a very and was and, and still is uh, a reliable, trustworthy partner and the leader of of Europe and the European Union. That's why we believe that uh, Germany's credibility, uh, political credibility. Uh, uh, will be damaged uh, because of Nord Stream 2. And here I'm, I'm talking not uh, from the perspective of Ukrainian, I'm talking with, with respect to the view that share our uh, friends from, from Baltic countries or Poland, for example. So now this is the, 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 the European issue uh, in a broader context. So we believe that energy security uh, will be uh, jeopardized if uh, Nord Stream 2 will uh, become will, will become operational. Okay, thank you. Our next question will be coming from our online audience, uh, the advocates of the ICJ2. Their question is, your ideas concerning efforts for diplomacy are mainly with Western Europe, but not with Russia. If your diplomatic efforts are focused on solely associating with the West, wouldn't this only further isolate Russia? making them even less likely to be diplomatic in the future with you and other Eastern European countries in a similar situation? I don't agree with this statement in a sense that uh, we are a sovereign country and uh, uh, we can define our in, in, and will define our future by ourselves. And uh, again, I can tell you uh, 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 as, as a diplomat here in Germany, this is something that we are uh, experience here during our uh, contacts and negotiation that very often uh, Germany or some other countries react uh, or don't want to react because they are afraid how Russia will respond. And we believe that this is not the clever uh, policy because first of all you have to pursue your own interests, right? And uh, for us it's very clear. Uh, I, I can tell you from from my personal uh, experience, uh, my my family was was always uh, supporting good relations with with Russia and with the European Union. But how can you uh, have normal relations with the country that annexed par part of uh, your territory? Uh, and once again, I, I can just stress what what I told you that. Putin claims that Ukrainians and Russians are one people, but if, if we are one people, right, uh, then how can you uh, stuck us in the back and occupy our territory and, 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 and kill so, so many people? This is not uh, how uh, relations in, family, in families are, are, are built. And that's why for us, for, for my country now, the choice is, 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 is very clear that we, we are moving west. This is... Uh, uh, this is anchored in our constitution right now, in, in, and uh, this this choice is obvious. And if you simply compare, I mean, how uh, the standards of uh, life in in Russia and uh, in the West, then I think that uh, the answer should be evident for you. I mean, we we are we we had enough, and uh, once again, Russia is our neighbor and will remain our neighbor. I hope that uh, uh, one day we, we can live uh, uh, normally in, in peace, but uh, with Putin's Russia and with, with, without, with, with that apparatus that uh, uh, is in Russian government right now, uh, it is impossible because they uh, want Ukraine to be a failed state. We'll have a question from our live audience. Hello, I'm James Simonovitz. I'm the delegate of India on the Disarmament Committee. And I was wondering what we as citizens of uh, Western democracies, you know, citizens of the EU, uh, personally a citizen of the United States, can ask of our government to combat Russian disinformation, or is it the responsibility of Ukraine solely to 
combat that disinformation? Well, first of all, I should and want to say that uh, since 2014, um, we enjoyed uh, a very big support uh, from our partners, uh, in particular from the United States, uh, Germany, France, Great Britain, other countries. Uh, so, uh, and this uh, support was very important uh, to contain the Russia and to uh, stop her uh, further escalating the situation. And uh, well, f what what our partners can do as, uh, uh, is basically to stay uh, uh, to stay supportive, to stay behind us in uh, in in different dimensions. And uh, I, I mentioned. Uh, the possibility of giving us uh, the European perspective security guarantees. So, uh, in in case of the United States, uh, uh, your country is supported, supported, and still supporting us very much uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, less lethal weapon uh, financial assistance and so on. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, the key point here is that if we stay united, if there is clear understanding that, for example, referendum, if I may return to this point, was illegal, then, then we are on the same page. When these lines uh, began to be blurred, then we are in a very dangerous position. I, I can give you one particular example. It was clear for everyone five, six, seven years ago that Russia is the party to the conflict. And by the way, Putin himself stated uh, in in the interview that uh, we we yes we were behind annexation of Crimea and we were behind the the war in the eastern Ukraine so it was clear at that time but now because Russia is very effective in uh, its disinformation uh, in propaganda campaign because in in democracies in democratic countries, it works. I mean, you have many opinions, you have many voices, but here the line is very clear. It's the one line, and uh, you have this multiple box, toolbox that is is very effective. President says particular things, then minister, then TV, and everyone speaks with one voice, and then it's uh, it, it 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 starts to 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 bring fruits. For example, now we are in, during the negotiations. Uh, some 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 arguments flow that well, Russia is not party to the conflict. You have to engage in direct uh, dialogue with the uh, occupied authorities on these uh, territories. But uh, this is not how it works. I mean, and naturally there is this fatigue uh, because there are other country con conflicts that. Uh, 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 that takes place in different parts of the world. So uh, my idea is, uh, and my suggestion for you uh, to look on this, not as a solely Ukrainian problem, but to look uh, on, on the broader scale, what, what is happening right now in Europe with this gas uh, disputes uh, and gas pressure with migrants that, are, that Russia and Belarus are also weaponizing right now. Um, the situation in Black Sea, I mean, it's everywhere. Cyber attacks here in Germany. People, uh, people are killed uh, in the center park in Berlin, right? And we know who, who, who are behind these attacks. Alexei Navalny, opposition leader, uh, was poisoned and then arrested. And well, who cares now? He is, uh, he is in jail. Who raises this issue, right? Because life goes on. So my goal as a diplomat and my, 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 my fellow citizens is to remind that the danger is still, is still here. And I mean, you see that the conflict uh, between uh, democracy and authoritarianism uh, is, is widening. So we want to be on a, uh, uh, not on a side of evil, right, but on a, on a good side. Thank you. Judge Mina Wang from the ICJ2 would like to ask the speaker, how does the speaker think the rise of right-wing populism in Europe and the EU affect the situation in Ukraine? Well, as we know, and from uh, according to our uh, estimates, the the clear uh, goal that Russia, uh, Russian government pursues uh, in in Europe is to split uh, Europe in different uh, parts. So, 
uh, they uh, they are working with populist parties like here in Germany uh, with uh, alternative uh, for Germany for example the uh, right wing party that uh, has a very strong pro-Russian sentiment that is very nationalistic uh, so they are working with these movements in, in different parts of Europe and their idea to break the, the, the European unity and the purpose uh, is very cunning and is very simple because it's uh, it's easier to uh, find a consensus uh, with the particular country rather than with the uh, community uh, of, of countries that share same values. Um, so basically for Russia um, it's not a big problem to buy loyalty and once again even here in Germany we know some politicians that are completely uh, that are famous uh, Russian lobbies. Uh, so basically populism is good for Russia but bad for Ukraine and Europe. We'll have a final question from our uh, live audience. Uh, thank you again for your speech. Uh, you mentioned before that Germany is still viewed as a respectable partner. Does this apply to the whole of the Ukrainian population? How has the general public um, maybe support for becoming part of the EU suffered from the ongoing completion of Nord Stream 2? We have very good uh, relations with Germany and uh, Germany was basically uh, one of the initiators of uh, Normandy format uh, to seek a solution of the conflict. And uh, particularly I, I want to underline here the importance of uh, Chancellor Merkel because uh, she invested a lot of her personal efforts, energy uh, uh, in, in, in finding a solution and, and to the conflict settlement. So uh, she was, she and the German government was behind the unity uh, about the sanctions against Russia. And uh, there have been some countries that they have been speculating to, to abandon sanctions because they're not eff effective. But uh, let's be honest, they're, they're, the, 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 the instrument, the, the, there is not so many instruments to, to have at least some impact on Russia. Uh, apart from unity uh, sanctions and uh, uh, quick response. Uh, so we have uh, good relations with, with Germany. Uh, Germany uh, supports us a lot financially, economically. Uh, um, we uh, are a bit upset and uh, I have to be honest, the public in Ukraine is a bit upset that uh, Germany and France were against uh, uh, given Ukraine a membership action plan of NATO in 2008. And uh, we believe that uh, it was uh, it was not a uh, correct decision. And if you look what happened after Ukraine and Georgia were refused this map of NATO, then the war in Georgia started 2008, the same year. And then in six years, the Crimea was the next. So basically, uh, this is... Uh, my point for those of you who think that well NATO is a very delicate issue if we allow Ukraine to be a member of NATO then Russia will definitely attack uh, Ukraine and Europe and it will be a complete mess no I mean if we look if we look rationally how what what, what uh, whether Russia has attacked or tested or blackmailed country that uh, countries that are already members of the NATO like for example Baltic countries no only those who are not part of the team are in in in, in immediate, immediate danger so uh, once again Nord Stream 2 uh, is also something that uh, we think that is not right and was not right from the early beginning because I want to remind you that their, uh, in, uh, their initial agreement about Nord Stream 2 was signed in 2015 when the war in Ukraine was in full swing. So basically this was not how uh, in this case trustworthy partners behave. But apart from that uh, we are very grateful to Germany and all other countries for their support. 
Thank you to everyone who submitted questions. We truly received a staggering amount, but sadly, we no longer have time for any more. Thank you, Deputy, Deputy Ambassador, for taking this time to speak with us today. Let's give him, let's give him a big hand. Additionally, we've also prepared a small token of our gratitude, um, which, well, we did more. We know this is only small compensation for you taking time out of your busy schedule to speak with us today, uh, but we've prepared a, a cup and some cookies for you. Thank you. Um, and we hope you enjoy them. With that, this interesting and interactive event is over. Uh, we hope that you all gained insights from Mr. Yemeyanov's uh, interesting remarks and are able to take these back into the debate and your committees and, um, yes, make sure that you keep them in mind and discuss them while Bermian keeps going. For all delegates, uh, you are now dismissed if you are part of the AM committees, the committees that had session before. For all PM delegates, you will now be joining your sessions on the Bermian platform. For those leaving us now, um, good. I hope you have a nice afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. Uh, and we hope to see you tomorrow at the conference. For all staff, we still have a staff debriefing now in the second. Please stay. Uh, yeah. And then goodbye. Thank you for your attention. And thank you again, Mr. Yemelyanov, for coming to speak with us today. Thank you.